The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. There we go. Thank you all for coming out. This is my first time itself and really impressed so far. This is a session on the very basics of MySQL. Uh, there's at least two people in here who probably are going to be bored <laughs> senseless, um, hopefully bored senseless. MySQL is the most popular database on the web and this is your session. So if you have any questions, please shout them out. We'll bring it up. This is to teach you all you need to know how to install it get it running, shut it down, and start becoming a DBA. Uh, first thing is it's pronounced MySQL, not MySQL. Uh, some folks are very touchy about this. I'm not. Um, man over here nodding his head will tell you there are some old, old timers who are very, very touchy about this. This is our agenda. We're going to talk about installation, starting, stopping, how you connect to a MySQL instance, loading data, a little bit of looking at data. It's kind of hard to go into SQL structured query language at any depth in an hour session. A little bit on backing up data, because if you've never lost data, it's a real experience. A little bit on how the login authentication system works, where to go from here, and some suggestions. And we'll have a formal question and answer at the end, but any time during this you have a question, this is your session for you to learn. So please uh, do that. If you need me, I'm david.stokes at oracle.com. On Twitter, I'm at Stoker. I'm always blogging on planet.mysql.com. So I'm fairly easy to reach. Okay, installation. Uh, how many of you are brand new, never installed a package on a Linux box before? Okay, so we can skip over that pretty well. If you're shy, catch me later. I can show you how to do that. I know there's some of, them, some of you are shy. Okay, normally for the Linux world, you either want an RPM or a DEB, or you want to use the binary installations. In the Windows world, we have a wonderful Windows installer. I know that's academic for most of the folks here. And if worse comes to worse, or you're just very, very curious, we have source code. Now, I recommend, rather than going to your distros download, going straight to dev.mysql.com. Why is that? Well, it's usually it's a little more updated. We're on top of some of the more recent patches. We also build things with a little bit better debuggers, well, better compilers than the distros do. And also the distros tend to lag a couple days at best because they're volunteers doing the buildings where we have paid professionals who are keeping things up to date. So those of you who have never seen this, um, apt-get or RPM, Oh, by the way, all these slides are on, going to be on slideshare.net as soon as I can get some bandwidth to uh, install them under slideshare.net slash Dave Stokes presentations, or I can put them on a thumb drive for you. Matter of fact, I have some thumb drives and other stuff to give away later. Now, the way I usually tell people to install things is using the binary installation. Um, how much Linux admin work time do you folks have under your belts? Are you kind of brand new at it, or are you kind of old hats at it, or? Anyone reading any of these commands up here going, what in the world is that? Okay, since most of you look kind of bored with this. This is the procedure on how to install it with binaries. It's very well documented with the tarball that comes with it. It's also well documented on the MySQL documentation. Um, if you're shy and this is all gibberish to you, come see me later, we'll get this running. Show you what it all means. Now there's a couple gutches in here. The first thing is under the support directory, we have some configuration files. Currently, they're kind of outdated. A big system, meaning huge system, is four gigs of memory. I doubt if anyone in here has a iPhone with less than four gigs of memory. So these files haven't aged well and you may have want to tailor them to get better performance out of your system. 
And if you don't have a configuration file, MySQL, the daemon will start up and it will use some pre-built, uh, pre-configuration uh, settings that are not great. Uh, if you're just starting off, use it with a distro. Okay. If you want to become a pr production DBA, I recommend going this way. Um, if it's mission critical and you're just really need to support it, need the latest and greatest, go with the what we give you. Uh, if you're learning it for yourself, uh, go with what the distro has. So, if you decide later to take it off, you can just do, you know, uh, RPM minus E or app get remove. But for the mission critical stuff, please <laughs> do it the way I, I showed you. Okay, usually MySQL is started with a wrapper called MySQL D underscore safe. And you pass it the user that you installed MySQL as. Uh, if you haven't learned, you don't want various processes running as root unattended on your box. Uh, there's other sessions around here that will tell you security reasons why you don't want to do that. But most people see this wrapper and they never pay any attention to it. And they don't realize that underneath it's actually running a program called MySQLD. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, if you don't want to start the binary by hand, uh, most Linux boxes either have the initd or the service constructs to start up the software. Yes, sir? Now the MySQLD safe, you would, you would run that as root and then it yes. Yeah, um, most people run it as MySQL. Um, that's just kind of the general default, but you can run it under anybody. So that wrapper is running a MySQL daemon. And if you want to type it out by hand, I used to do this all the time. Uh, wherever your install directory is, minus user equals MySQL. And when it starts up, it will try looking for a configuration file usually under Etsy or Etsy MySQL. And these are the files I mentioned a little earlier haven't aged well. Um, just giving you pointers so that when things start changing in the future and you start running more and more MySQL, you'll know where to look for things when you start it up. Now, on the right-hand side, well, that showed up a lot better than I thought. You can see how the configuration file is uh, partitioned out uh, ver the various sections are in these square brackets, and there's, this one has one for the client, one for just general MySQL programs, and one for the daemon. Here we're setting it to go to the default port, which is 3306. Uh, in the old days, um, a lot of folks would put things on the command line when they start up MySQL, which is real great until they go on vacation and someone else has to restart everything and they don't remember all the switches. So as you change things or you add features, make sure you put them in your configuration file. That way you don't have to tax your memory as much and other folks can come on behind you and get things running the way you used to do it when you go on vacation. And you can also add it to your favorite change control program. Are you going to go into more depth in that I got file? Just a little bit. Uh, there might be another session later today. Um, another great thing to do if you want to play with the changing the stuff but you don't want to play with VI or you don't want to do that. Uh, Chuck, are you having a session on Workbench later? Not Workbench itself. We also have a free tool called Workbench that will let you go through and, and change some of this stuff. So there's 20 ways to skin a cat. How many unskinned cats do you want? Once again, the uh, configuration file is broken up into sections. I can see client, MySQL, and the daemon. Uh, usually the stuff under MySQLD is what you're gonna be looking for for all the various stuff running in the, the main server. Um, you'll also see sections in there for odd programs like MyISAM check and all that you probably won't get into uh, as a beginner. Okay, now that you got it running, how do you stop it? Well, you can always do the uh, control alt delete on the box, uh, which is not recommended. Uh, you do the service MySQL stop, the init D stop, 
or my favorite is run the MySQL admin program to run shutdown. Uh, databases keep a lot of files open in memory, and if you do a hard shutdown, some of the stuff won't be flushed out to disk, and the next time you go to run it, you might be missing data. So make sure always, always, always when possible to bring down your MySQL server as neatly as possible. Now the dash U um, yes, sir. on there, so are you always going to put root for that? Or it could be root or it could be another privileged user. As a general user, you normally don't have shutdown privilege. privilege. We'll talk about the privileges a little bit later. Oh, okay, because it's a... Yeah. Okay. But uh, you don't want Joe, Joe Schmo getting on your box and shutting down your yeah. server during the middle of the day. I, I just didn't know that if you, like if you would SU to, to the MySQL user, if you could issue that command without the dash U flag. It depends on how you set it up, but usually not. Usually you want to um, run it something like this. Okay, so you have it running, you can bring it up, you can bring it down. How do I actually get to the database? Well, we have a MySQL client program called, cleverly, MySQL, and you give it a database name. Now, the second example there, um, we're showing you how you can pass a username and a password to get to the database. If you don't give it a database, we'll collect it to the server, but it will not have a database at the other end waiting to talk to you. Now the third example down here is an example of how you can load data. So here we're running MySQL to db underscore name. We're reading from a file called script.sql and we're throwing the output to another, tape, to another uh, file on uh, standard out. Uh, since we tend to call so many things MySQL, people tend to get confused between the client program, which is what we're using here, and the server. Now, if your database instance is on another machine, you have to tell it how to get there with either the minus minus host equals host name, which can be a fully qualified name, it could be the IP address, or the minus H host. The two commands are equivalent. Okay, so once you connect, what do you see? Well, if everything goes right, you're going to see a splash like this. And there are ways to get rid of that if you don't want your user seeing that. It will tell you what your connection is. Um, the, the version that you're running, uh, the lovely copyrighted Oracle message, and the general MySQL prompt. So if you have a user that says, I can't talk to this database, and you connect to that machine, you should see something like this. If you don't, uh, you might need to see if the service is running or if the network's even there. So if you do a slash S after you get things running, uh, you'll get a whole bunch of information. Uh, once again, we get our connection ID. We connected to the database world. This is our current user. Uh, when you have users that log in from different places, we'll talk about authentication later, and something works at home but it doesn't work at work or vice versa, this is what you want to check on, their current user. Um, some more general over information about the server. Now there's a gotcha here that Chuck would probably notice but probably not the rest of you. MySQL can use different character sets and collations, which means you can have Sedils and umlauts, and if you need them. Uh, if you don't, you can just stick to the Latin one character set. Now, most people tend, if they need umlauts or sedils or circumflexes, they're going to use UTF-8. Big trouble is they do not, Latin one and UTF-8 are not equivalent. So sometimes if you're moving stuff between different character sets, you'll get goo and there's no way to ungoo the goo once you get it. Um, yeah. so, so as beginners, your goal is to figure out how to keep that equal to that. 
And by the way, as Americans, we can stick by Latin one because it's in the Constitution, I believe. No, that was a joke. Now, show databases will show you the available databases to the current user. And in this case, you can see that we did a show database with the command terminated with a semicolon. Or you can terminate it with a slash G. Uh, if you're an old time SQL person and you come over from Oracle or DB2, you probably want to do the slash G. Uh, if you're a Perl programmer, you'll probably want to do the semicolon. They're the same thing. Uh, since like 3.21. Yeah. And uh, we even have another one we, we can show you. By the way, to get out of the client, slash Q. And there's also a lovely slash H to, that will give you help that will scroll off the screen until you learn how to. Uh -uh. Yes, sir? Oh, you actually want me in the, in the video. Oh, that's horrible. That's going to torture the folks who didn't actually come. Loading data. We have some example databases you can get from, from MySQL. And if you've gone through our doc sets, or you've gone through our training classes, or you've gone through our certification program, you've probably seen them. Uh, they're called World and Tequila. Here's an example of we start up MySQL whoop, on the local box. And notice I didn't give it a database name. MySQL comes up, and I got rid of all the startup messages. And I say, OK, create a database called world, with a, ending with a slash g. could be a semicolon. Um, and then I say, use that database, which is kind of like the CD of, into the database. And then I can tell it source world underscore inodb.sql. And it will take the files from the world database and put it into the system. This is a standard way of loading in data. Uh, if you run something like Moodle or Drupal or anything like that, this is the way they're going to load up tables behind the scenes. Uh, it's not mysterious. It's actually rather uh, unmagical when you start looking at it in the real world. OK, so you load the data, and you're not a DBA, and you're just starting. What can you do? Well, the first command you're going to want to do is show tables. This will show you that in that world database, you have three tables, city, country, and country language. And a very simple SQL command is select star, which is the wild card for everything, from the table city. Or you can actually explicitly, if you know the column name, select name, country code from city. And you can give it qualifiers, like where population is over 10 million. And once again, these slides will be up on slideshare.net under slideshare.net slash Dave Stokes slash presentations as soon as I can get some network bandwidth today. OK, so you're the good Linux admin, and you want to learn how to back up the data. There are lots and lots of ways to back up the data. Usually, you serialize it, or you do some sort of snapshot. Um, the folks who are used to LVM snapshots, you can do that. Uh, most people tend to serialize the data when they start off. And we supply a wonderful client program called MySQL Dump. Um, it's very basic. It doesn't do a lot of really neat stuff. But when you're beginners, play with this. It will work over the network so you can back up stuff from another host. It's a good way to move data sets around if you have to. And you normally give it a command like MySQL Dump, uh, minus minus all databases, and give it a file name. If you don't give it a file name, walk away from your terminal for a while because you're getting a bunch of characters on standard out for a while. And you can actually spell out. The, man page, the manual page for this is like five or six pages printed out. But as novices, please back up your data when you start off this way. Uh, there are other programs out there that will do intermittent parallel backups, um, intermittent backups. Uh, you can schedule to run at various intervals and all that. But this is kind of like the beginning, kind of like using VI to learn how to text edit on a Linux box. OK, login authentication. 
Uh, for those of you who've been playing with Pam for a while, you're going to find this a little bit um, pedestrian. When a connection is made from a MySQL client to a server, it looks at what host are you coming in. If that host is not allowed in the, in the user table, it ignores the connection. If that host is OK, it says, OK, what user do they want to connect as? And then it will check username and password. Um, of course, to make things even more muddier, all the stuff is kept in a database called MySQL. So when someone says, gee, there's something wrong with the MySQL database as a DBA, you think, oh my god, that's the user privileges database. And the user's probably just talking about the database in general. Now, doing this by hand on the command line, you can do it. There's 19 privileges you have to either set to a capital Y or a capital N, and it's a real good typing exercise. I have dyslexic fingers, get halfway through a command line and end up messing it up. Uh, thank God we have GUI tools like MySQL Workbench. Um, some of you might like PHP Madden, my admin on that. Workbench is really nice because it lets you point and click, and it has preset privilege groups that you can just click for somebody. Um, the other big hint is when you're starting out, be stingy with permissions. If you've ever given root privilege to someone in your company that didn't need it, but you gave it to them anyway and have been burned by it, you can see why this is. And the best thing, after you learn how to shut it up, shut, start up MySQL and uh, bring it down, start reading through chapter six of the MySQL manual. Uh, this is where a lot of DBAs get burned. It's not that long. But there's a couple of gotchas in there you need to know about that I can't go into in a simple one hour session. Uh -huh. um, in reference to host, does it actually use the IP address of the TCP connection? It can. Okay. It can, yeah. And then I assume you can use host name too. Yes. Does that mean then that host lookup depends on DNS connection properly? Yes. Okay. Um, That's what I wondered. Yes, sir. We're going to reset your question. The, the question was, does host lookup affect connections? And one of the things you'll find out very rapidly is that if your DNS goes bad, people will call you up and blame the database. Um, what's happening is the, the MySQL server is going out and saying, OK, this guy's coming in from this address. It's not on my table, but it's at a host name that I don't have cached. And that's when you get the vicious cycle of the DNS is down, therefore it's the database's problem even though it's, the database is fine. Same thing happens if you don't have any reverse lookup. You can have IP address, and there's no way to log the IP address. Suddenly, you just can't log in. Okay. So check your reverse lookup. Yeah. Uh, I'm very surprised that no one in the user community ha in the Linux world has not decided everyone should pay a dollar to peak Maka Petrus and crew for DNS. Um, if you've never gone into that code or you've never heard Pete Michael speak about DNS, it, it's worth the time. Um, user table grows with just about every sub-release that we have. The fields that you're going to concentrate on are the host name, the username, and password. Now you can set up accounts where you're Joe coming in from home and you have different privileges than you do Joe from the office or Joe from your mobile device. Um, one of the things that will happen is you'll have someone complain to you that, gee, this was working great this weekend at home. I come into work and it's not right. Uh, what you'll end up having to do is sort the host table and find out if they have multiple logins or how they're coming in. Um, back when I showed you the backslash S where it shows you the current user, that's what you're going to look at. You're going to compare the username and the host. And if you're walking into an established MySQL system that's been around running since version 3.1 or version 4, do not be surprised if you have multiple entries from the same person. So how many folks do all their admin through the command line on their Linux boxes here? OK. Um, that's the way I learned on Unix. That's the way I've done it on my Linux boxes ever since. Um, when you're trying to remember the various 19 privileges for MySQL, 
um, trying to remember the SQL syntax and putting all these things with the yes or no. It's painful. Um, use Workbench, it's free. It has a whole bunch of other uh, bits to it, like a query tool. It also has an entity relationship mapper. So if you get someone else's databases and you don't know where the various tables reference each other, uh, you do that and get a nice printout of what the tables look like. But the most valuable thing for a novice DBA is it will let you create accounts, check out their privileges, turn things on and off on a GUI. And if you're doing it by the command line, what will bite you every time is you'll forget the command at the very end called flush privileges. If you change something in the table, here's a man laughing, he's been bit by it. Yeah, you uh, make all these lovely changes and you don't tell the server that the privileges have changed, go back and reread the privilege table. And it's like, the, if you don't do that, the server doesn't know the changes have been made and you are just confused. So rather than retype all these, um, it's easier to use the command line. Now this is unfortunately hard to see, but we use a backslash capital G. Remember earlier I talked about the semicolon and the lowercase g? If you don't want things going out on a horizontal format, you can use the backslash capital G and it will output the information in a horizontal format. Now, like I said, it's kind of hard to give you the basics in an hour. Um, if you really are interested in running MySQL, please download the slide deck a little bit later. But this is kind of a vast overview of a huge subject, and I can't go very much in depth on anything here. But the trick is, I started uh, having no knowledge and was able to learn it. Uh, lots of other folks have. It's a very valuable skill to have. I used to run certification for MySQL, and about twice a week I get calls from folks looking for certified DBAs. MySQL DBAs are in high demand. So if I haven't scared you away, please think about training on MySQL. Now you can do it through a training class. I highly recommend the MySQL classes. There's some other vendors out in the hallway that will have some training classes. A lot of areas have good local users groups that run training. Uh, your local Oracle users group might have some too. Webinars, MySQL runs about eight webinars a month and they're all free. And we have a bunch that are on, on demand. So you can go back and listen to those. The lady in the room next door runs a podcast every week and she covers in a little 10, 15 minute segment various subjects. We also have conferences. Uh, the next big conference is gonna be right before Oracle Open World. It's called MySQL Connect. Um, we got, just had an innovation day on Tuesday and the webcast on that should be ready for a replay. There are shows like this one, uh, Self PauseCon. I don't know if any of you attended PauseCon early in the year where we do do sessions. I recommend scanning planet.mysql.com. This is a blog aggregation site that goes over who's doing what. And there's also forums out there. Right now we're getting spammed by some folks in Vietnam. They're trying to sell us some of their Freon um, refrigeration systems, but some of the forums are, uh, it's only hitting a couple of the forums. But this is a good place where if you have a question, put it out there on the relevant forum. Another place to go if you're a novice is I really recommend uh, this book. Uh, the author is in the room next door. This really is a Bible. It should be on your, your book stand. Once you get down the road a little bit further, um, you should get this book. One of the authors is sitting in the back. <laughs> um, this really doesn't cover the beginning basics, but once you get limping along, this will give you a lot of great material on how to speed things up, how to organize, uh, how to get into replication. And don't buy the first or second edition. The new third edition has been out for about a month now. 
Uh, another speaker here this week, uh, Ronald Bradford has a series. The first book's out. They're little, they're short, they're like 150 pages, and they're very concise. And he, the one on backup is just coming out, and the optimization's been out for six or seven months. If you're interested in certification, this is still the manual for certification, even though it's MySQL 5.0 on the cover. Um, we're currently, 5.5 is generally available. This is also a good general reference book. It's beginning to get a little bit dated, but I doubt if there'll be a uh, major update anytime soon. So if you're in a used bookstore and you see a copy of this, grab it. And I did that a lot faster than I thought I would, but I wanted to have time for general questions, um, see if anyone was stuck any place. Um, let me go back to the let me go back to the very beginning. Uh, SlideShare.net slash Dave Stokes slash presentations. Or if you want, grab one of my business cards and I can email it to you. Yeah. So, you folks have been playing with MySQL. What would you recommend more for beginners? What would you recommend for beginners? I'm sorry, I missed the question. Um, you've done MySQL, you set up MySQL servers before. Yes. What else would you recommend that for the novices in the room? The number one thing that I see as a sysadmin uh -huh. is that it's good to have um, a separate user for each website that you're hosting. So, you know, it's very common to have a, a MySQL backend for various websites. Uh -huh. And if you're hosting several of them all on a single server, the idea is create a separate database for each and then create a separate user for each. And then what you do is grant, you know, if you're running something on WordPress, you could create a user WP1 and then grant WP1 full access to just that one database. And then the good thing about that is that if someone figures out how to get in and look at that one set of data, they can't see all the other data. Okay, cool. So I think that's probably the main thing that I noticed in running MySQL as a sysadmin. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, you want me? Oh, Make sure you get a dolphin. Very cool. Yeah. Since you're mentioning, you know, user tips, PHP my admin has saved my butt more times than I can even tell you just because of the ease of the interface as opposed to doing everything command line. Okay. I think having that GUI tool to be an administrator has got to be the number one thing. You know, because if you've got to research all of those things every single time you need to do something, it's going to take you, you know, hours and hours. So that, that would be my advice. Yeah. Well, I got to admit, I'm a dinosaur. I learned on the command line and I just gave up on it this year. So, and I've been using MySQL since 321 came out. Uh, you can do it that way, but why? I, I was the same way. I grew up on a command line too, and you know, once I switched over to GUI, I never went back. Okay. And yes, for those of you without gray hair, it was kind of hard doing all this computer stuff with the dinosaurs roaming around. Okay, do we have any novices with some questions? You're totally fabricated. you want? When you're setting up, it, it looked like you probably covered enough of this information, but the, uh, for example, if you have a, a Linux server that has no GUI on it, and I'm not, I'm used to the GUI stuff like PHP my admin, I've used that yeah. one for, for the MySQL setups. Uh, it looks, how, how, what would be the example of the, how to set up exactly to be able to get to it from another machine to be able to fire up the yeah. uh, a, a GUI based SQL management, yeah. MySQL management. Well, you Xterm into this, Xterm onto the box, do the installation, do all this lovely stuff, and then you use PHP MyAdmin or Workbench or one of the other tools, and you just tell it 
we're working on this host. And if you have the permissions, the privileges, the network, and everything else set up, it's like working on a local host. Right, okay, but so. just, just setting up the, 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 the server to allow the remote host is, that was, I assume that was part of what was covered in the, uh, the authentications part, yeah. that you would allow it, that host. Yeah, but usually if you're say like on a, a Ubuntu box, you do the app get install MySQL server and all the required tools, it's gonna open up port 3306 for you and you can log in across the network to get to the box. Okay, I, I've, I've, the reason I'm asking is I've tried that before, but it says you know, something like, this is restricted to host 127.0.0.1, and it will not allow me to do that remotely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're gonna have, yeah, you're gonna have to get on the box, mm -hmm. X term, you're gonna have to MySQL minus user root, MySQL database and modify the user table. And usually what most people do is they find the entry for root and they change the, the IP address slot for the host to a wildcard. Right. It's not the most secure thing in the world <laughs> and it will bite you on the butt. Um, but for general setup, you can get away with it. Yeah, that might be something like just do this until I get, a, I get to it. Yeah, okay, yeah. thanks. Just something else you can do too is if you learn how to use um, X Windows, you can you can host your X Windows back to another box where you have uh, graphics you know have graphics uh, ability, and uh, that works too. And that's that's something that, that if you're you're admin doing administering of of um, headless machines like that, that, that's a really good way to do it. I've I've had to do that a lot of times, and that's a that's more of a general skill to learn to use, is use remote X windows, and that, that helps a lot. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just noticed that the SSL option is available. Uh, yes. I guess I got a couple of questions. One is, how do you implement it? And two is, do you need a separate port for it? Um, no, you don't need a separate port for it. Um, I've only set it up once, and that was years ago. It's very well documented in the manual. Oh, okay. Um, so I just look up a cookbook and follow yeah, the if, recipe. <laughs> if you go to the manual pages on implementing SSL, it, it's out there. Um, it's one of those things where I did once, and uh, not something I can pull off the top of my head right here, especially with all the certificates and pointing it to the files and all that. But there are lots of folks who run SSL. Yeah. Do you know will it support SSL and unencrypted both at the same time? or can you require SSL? Um, you, I believe you can require SSL, so they have to come in with the certificate and sign and all that. I'm 99.99% yeah. sure, but. Yeah, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Come on, the rest of you had some coffee this morning. Come on, let's. Well, if you have any questions later, um, let me go all the way to the... Oops. We got about 14 minutes left, and uh, I want to hear about any nightmare stories uh, in your DBA world. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I'd like to introduce one of the other community managers we have. This is Keith Larson in the back. Um, the gentleman in the blue shirt over there is Chuck Bell, who will be talking about some of the new utilities we have, including the one where you can set it up so that you're if your master goes out, it automatically fails over to one of your slave servers. And probably a little bit on global transaction IDs in there and all that fun stuff. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And if you have questions on sessions you don't see this year but you want to have next year, please see Keith or myself because we're gonna keep coming back until you folks get this right. And we wanna make sure that we're giving you the information that you need and you want. Yes, sir. He wanted a horror story, so I'll give you a horror story. Um, I maintain uh, a couple of Moodle servers for our uh, division website at the university. And we are completely separate from our IT department, so we don't get any help from them unless we really screw up. Okay, 
Um, we prefer it that way. So anyway, I uh, get a phone call one morning from the ac associate academic dean wondering why we're running a porn site on our server. Well, it's a liberal arts college, isn't it? I'm sorry? It's a liberal arts college, right? Yeah. And I don't know. Come to find out, uh, due to a security hole in Moodle, someone was injecting SQL into our databases that was causing them to basically have links to porn websites somewhere else in Europe and they were coming through us and of course it was masked through us because of that so we had to go and find where the security hole was in the SQL and take it out so there is a good horror story when you get that phone call from the academic dean wondering what the hell are you guys doing down in the math department <laughs> Vector geometry, I always blame it on vector geometry. Um, another Moodle horror story, um, actually some are Moodle to Moodle. Kuali is another system that universities are developing open source. And at USC, which is one of the paragons of the Kuali movement, uh, one of our SEs was there last week and damn it, the database is running slow. Well, he got on there and showed him wasn't the database is running slow, it was their Tomcat server was misconfigured. So what they're doing every time the database ran slow was stop the database, restart the database. During that time, the Tomcat server would reset and work great. So now they just realize that they don't have a database problem. Okay. I'm sorry I ran out of dolphins. Do you have any more dolphins at the table, Keith? So you have to mug somebody in this room to make sure you get a dolphin. Well, thank you all for coming out. If you have any MySQL questions, get any of us with the little dolphin things or Keith. Uh, we have two tracks, and like I said, we're gonna be back next year. So if you have suggestions about stuff you wanna see, let us know. Um, if you have general questions, I'm david.stokes at Oracle. Oops, I'm supposed to be back in front of the screen. Um, please contact us, let us know. And please, please, please become DBAs if you go to your local MySQL user group meeting, you'll find that a third of the people there are looking to hire DBAs. Peter, how many DBAs would you like to hire this week? Five. Five. So that's the front row. The other couple rows, you're gonna have to go out and look someplace else, so. Wait till next week, okay. Well, thank you all very much for coming out. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. 
The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP guest phones, uniquely designed to complement any asterisk or switch fox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the, uh, you know, of the community and, and the speed at which these, uh, these, you know, these, these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack well, management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and uh, 
and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the clouds tag.